Hey guys, happy Friday. I'm missing you so much. Um, I've been really loving this sunshine, even though in the morning time it's usually been pretty cloudy, but I hope you're getting outside and getting some sunlight, running around and enjoying yourself. I'm really proud about how you guys have progressed learning through angles and finding those missing angle measurements because I know that that's tricky, but you guys have done really awesome. So you'll be thankful to hear that today's math lesson is going to be super quick. It's going to be pretty easy. It's kind of just a lot of vocabulary. So we're going to be going into types of lines. And we're just going to talk about three today. All right. So, and this should be a review. So we have parallel lines, perpendicular and intersecting. And I took a picture of this and I put it on our Google Classroom. So that way, when you're doing your independent work, you can come back and look at this to make sure that you're totally understanding the work that you're doing by yourself or with your mom or dad. So most important thing about parallel lines is that they never touch. We talked about this a little bit when we were working on polygons and classifying quadrilaterals. Um, we were saying how a trapezoid only has one set of parallel lines. Um, and if we think about a uh, trapezoid, we know usually those side ones, they are slanted, so we know that eventually they'll run into each other. But the top and the bottom, they never touch. That's why they are parallel. All right, so parallel lines, they're never touched. The arrows mean that lines go on and on and on for forever. So if these parallel lines kept going, never would they touch. Perpendicular. So the two tricky ones are going to be perpendicular and intersecting, and you're going to see why here in a second. So perpendicular lines, they intersect, and intersect just means that they go through each other. They touch. They, you know, somehow cross. Perpendicular lines have to intersect at a right angle. So you see right here how um, it makes like a little square that is to show a right angle. So whenever you see an angle that has this little symbol on the inside, that's telling you that that's 90 degrees. It's a square angle, which means that's your right angle. If it does not intersect at 90 degrees, then they are just intersecting lines. All right, so you see here they're intersecting, but that's obviously not um, a 90 degree angle. So perpendicular has to be 90 degrees. It has to intersect at a right angle. Intersecting is all other lines that intersect at any other kind of angle. Perpendicular has to be 90 degrees. So your independent work today is going to be super easy. It's just going to ask you, it's going to show you pictures of some lines telling, asking you, is it parallel, perpendicular, or intersecting? And then it's going to ask you to draw examples of each of these. All right, so super easy. Just make sure that you're looking back. Like I said, I'm putting this on Google Classroom. Save it somewhere in your camera roll so you can look back at this so you don't get this perpendicular and intersecting mess, messed up because those are the two that are going to trip you up. And like always, email me if you guys have any questions on that. So we left off in Number the Stars where Anne-Marie had to take the basket that had the cheese, apple, and bread in it, and that packet hidden underneath. So that packet, we know, is super important. She saw Peter give it to um, Ellen's father and said, you need to give this to Henrik. It's very important. Well, Ellen's father, when they were leaving that night, tripped on one of the steps and it fell out of his pocket. And Anne-Marie and Mama didn't see it until the next morning when Anne-Marie was helping Mama into the house. Mama has a broken ankle, so she can't go back to the dock to give it to them. So even though she knows it's really dangerous, she has no other option but to send Anne-Marie down um, with this basket with the packet hidden inside. And she told her, she warned her, she was like, if anyone is to stop you, you would have to just say that you're bringing... Your uncle, who's a fisherman, his lunch. Make it a joke. Say that he's forgetful. Um, so it really kind of left us wondering, like, hmm, do we think that Anne Marie is going to get stopped by a Nazi soldier? Knowing the story, I'm thinking that she might. I don't think it's going to be easy just her running there, getting the packet, and then her running home. I think she's definitely going to encounter a problem. 
Only now, entering the woods on the footpath, did Anne-Marie realize how cold the morning was. She had watched and helped earlier as the others donned sweaters, jackets, and coats, and she peered into the night, following them with her eyes as they moved silently off bulky in their garments, blankets, and their arms. But she wore only a light sweater over her cotton dress. Though the October day later would be warmed by the sunlight, right now it was gray, chilly, and damp, and she shivered. So there was a lot of visualizing in those first two paragraphs about um, how she watched the Rosens and the other people that were accompanying them leave that night before, and all of the bulky clothing that they were wearing and now she's kind of realizing, well, here I am. It's the morning time. The sun isn't really out yet. She is only wearing a thin sweater. So this is something that all of you can probably relate to, how in those months of, um, especially like in February, how it would be super, super cold in the morning, but then we would go out to recess and um, you guys were sweating and you didn't need your jackets anymore. And that's kind of what Anne Marie is saying is, Right now, in the morning time, she's really cold only having a light sweater. She knows later on in the day that she would be fine with what she was wearing, but right now she's cold and she's kind of envying um, all the people that left in the middle of the night with these bulky sweaters to keep them warm. <clears throat> the path curved and she could no longer look behind and see look behind her and see the clearing with the farmhouse outlined against the pale sky and the lightning meadow beyond. Now, there were only the dark woods ahead. Underfoot, the path latticed with thick roots hidden under the leaves. They were invisible. She felt her way with her feet, trying not to stumble and fall. The handle of the straw basket scratched her arm through her sweater. She shifted it and tried to run. She thought of a story she had often told Kirsty as they cuddled up in bed at night. Once upon a time, there was a little girl, she told herself silently, who had a beautiful red cloak her mother had made for her. She wore it so often that everyone called her Little Red Riding Hood. I don't know if you guys remember, but actually in my last video, I made a connection when Anne-Marie's mom told her to go get the basket. I said the same thing that it reminded me of Little Red Riding Hood and now Anne-Marie is actually thinking of the story Little Red Riding Hood. So it's really cool when you see those connections that you make as a reader actually come true in the book. Kirsty would always interrupt there. Why is it called a Red Riding Hood? Kirsty would ask. Why didn't they call her like Little Red Cloak? Well, it had a hood that covered her head. She had beautiful curls just like you, Kirsty. Maybe someday Mama will make you a coat with a hood to cover your curls and keep you warm. But why? Kirsty would ask. Why was it a riding hood? Was she riding a horse? Maybe she had a horse and she rode sometimes, but not in this story. Now stop interrupting me every minute. Anne-Marie smiled in her memory, feeling her way through the dark, remembering how Kirsty always interrupted stories to ask questions. Often, she just wanted to make the story last longer. The story continued. One day, the little girl's mother said, I want you to take a basket of food to your grandmother. She's sick in bed. Come, let me tie your red cloak. The grandmother lived deep in the woods, didn't she? Kirsty would ask. In the dangerous woods where the wolves lived? Anne-Marie heard a small noise. A squirrel, perhaps? A rabbit? Scampering nearby? But she paused. She stood still on the path and smiled again. Kirsty would have been frightened. She would have grabbed Amory's hand and said, A wolf! A wolf! But Amory knew that these woods were not like the woods in the story. There were no wolves or bears or tigers, none of the beasts that populated Kirsty's vivid imagination. So she hurried on. Still, they were very dark, these woods. Amory had never followed this path in the dark before. She told her mother she would run, and she tried. Here the path turned. She knew the turning well, though it seemed different in the dark. As she turned to the left, it would take her to the road, out where it would be lighter and wider and more traveled. But it would be more dangerous, too. Someone could see her on the road. At this time of dawn, other fishermen would be on the road, hurrying to their boats for the long day at sea. And there might be soldiers. 
She turned to the right and headed deeper into the woods. It was why Mama and Peter had needed to guide those sorry, it was why Mama and Peter had needed to guide those who were strangers here. The Rosens and the others. A wrong turn could have taken them into danger easily. So Little Red Riding Hood carried the basket of food and hurried along through the woods. It was a lovely morning and birds were singing. Little Red Riding Hood sang too as she walked. Sometimes Anne Marie changed that part of the story, telling it to Kirsty. Sometimes it was raining or even snowing in the woods. Sometimes it was evening with long, frightening shadows so that Kirsty, listening, would snuggle closer and wrap her arms around Anne Marie. But now, telling it to herself, Anne Marie wanted sunlight and birds singing. Here, the path widened and flattened. It was a place where the woods opened on one side and the path curved beside a meadow at the edge of the sea. Here she could run, and she did. Here, in daylight, there would be cows in the meadow, and on summer afternoons, Anne Marie would always stop by the fence and hold out handfuls of grass, which the curious cows would take with their rough tongues. Here, her mother had told her, Mama would always stop too as a child walking to school. Her dog, Trofast, would wriggle under the fence and run about in the meadow, barking excitedly, trying to chase the cows, who always ignored him. But the meadow was empty now, and the colorless and they were colorless in the half-light. She could hear the churning sea beyond and see the wash of daylight to the east over Sweden. And she ran as fast as she could, searching with her eyes for the place ahead where the path, path would re-enter the woods in its final segment, which led into town. Here, the bushes were overgrown and it was difficult to see the path there. But she found the entrance beside the high blueberry bushes how often she stopped there in late summer to pick a handful of those sweet berries. Her hands and mouth would be blue afterwards. Mama always laughed when she came home. Now it was dark again, as the trees and bushes closed around her, and she had to move more slowly, though she still tried to run. Anne Marie thought of Mama, her ankles so swollen and her face so in pain. She hoped Mama had called the doctor by now. The local doctor was an old man brisk and business-like, through kind eyes. He had come to the farmhouse several times during the summers of the past, his battered car noisy on the dirt road. He had come once when Kirsty, a tiny baby then, had been sick and wailing with an earache. And he had come when Lees had spilled hot grease cooking breakfast and burned her hand. Anne Marie turned again as the path divided once more. The left fork would take her directly into the village. It was the way they had come from the train and the way Mama had walked to school as a girl. But Anne Marie turned to the right, heading toward the harbor side, where the fishing boats lay at anchor. She had often come this way before, too, sometimes at the end of the afternoon, to pick up Ingborg, Uncle Henrik's boat, from the many returning, and to watch him and his helpers unload the day's catch of slippery, shimmering herring still flopping in their containers. Even now, with the boats in the harbor ahead, empty of fish, preparing to leave for the day's fishing, she could smell the oily, salty scent of herring, which always reminded, in the, which always remained in the air there. It wasn't far now, and it was getting lighter. She ran as fast as she could run, uh, like she did at school, in the far Friday foot races. Almost as fast as she had run down that Copenhagen sidewalk on the day that the soldier had stopped her with his call of HALT! Anne Marie continued the story in her head. Suddenly, as Little Red Riding Hood walked through the woods, she heard a noise. She heard a rustling in the bushes. A wolf! Christy would always say, shivering with fearful delight. I know it's going to be a wolf! Anne Marie always tried to make this part longer tried to build up the suspense and mock her sister. She didn't know what it was. She stopped on the path and listened. Something was following her in the bushes. Little Red Riding Hood was very, very fearful. She would stop there, would stay silent for a moment, and beside her in bed she could feel Kirsty holding her breath. Then... Anne Marie would go on in a low, dreadful voice. She heard a growl. Anne Marie stopped suddenly and stood still on the path. 
There was a turn immediately ahead. Beyond it, she knew as soon as she rounded that turn, she would see the landscape open to the sea. The woods would be behind her there, and ahead of her would be the harbor, the docks, and the countless fishing boats. Very soon, it would be noisy there with engines starting, fishermen calling to one another, and gulls crying. But she had heard something else. She heard bushes rustling ahead, and she heard footsteps. And she was certain it was not her imagination. She heard a low growl. Cautiously, she took a step forward. And then another. She approached the turn in the path and the noises continued. Then, there they were, in front of her. Four armed soldiers with them, straining at taunt leashes, were two large dogs, their eyes glittering, and their lips curled. So, she gets on to the final turn, where she knows as soon as she makes this turn, she's going to be at the harbor, she can run down that dock, give Uncle Henrik exactly what they need so that the Rosens can be prepared to um, survive in Sweden, and all of a sudden she sees these soldiers with two dogs. Now, for your exit ticket, I want you to answer the question, why do you think the author, why do you think Lois Lowry is mentioning the story of Little Red Riding Hood in this chapter? What does the story about Little Red Riding Hood have to do with what Anne Marie is going on right now? Okay, what is she doing in this chapter that is very similar to Little Red Riding Hood? So that's the exit ticket that I want you to type up on your Google Doc today. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. Make sure you get outside and play. Uh, make sure you give your mom, dad, sister, brother, everybody a big hug and have a great day. I love you guys.